मिस्टर राजू रामाचंद्रन हाँ इसका actually let me tell you one thing we were expecting a gate crashing on this uh, for this lecture and therefore we have arranged a complete uh, room upstairs on the first floor with a proper screen because we are living in a digital world mm -hmm. and uh, many i will request the youngsters who, who could not get a seat here can go upstairs Uh, I always start uh, this evening because we had started this lecture from the year 2006. Mr. Well, Mr. Sorabji delivered the first Targunde Memorial Lecture, and I always use some of the Urdu couplet to start this evening. Uh, this uh, we we lawyers, particularly the eminent ones and very eminent arbitrators, are accused of charging very high fees. So on this. Uh, A, a, a couplet has been written by a, um, by a poet, which says, "Kabza dila diya mujhe mere makan ka, mere jo hai vakil adimun nazir hai, pucho jo unki fees, to ab us makan me khud hazrate vakil rehaish pazir hai." <laughs> my lawyer helped me to get possession of my house. He is blessed with unmatchable foresight. The fees, however, so high that it cost me the coveted house. <laughs> I welcome all of you on behalf of our president, Justice Madan Lokur, our Vice President, Mr. Raju Ramathan Chandran, our Secretary, Mrs. Manik Karanjawala, and also the members of the Tarkunde Memorial Foundation for the 14th Tarkunde Memorial Lecture, which is being delivered today by Honorable the Chief Justice of India. Honorable Justice Dr. D. Y. Chandrachud, the topic chosen chosen by His Lordship is upholding civil liberties in the digital age, privacy, surveillance, and free speech. I have a small debt to discharge. Last year, the 13th Tarkunde Memorial Lecture was delivered by Honorable Mr. Justice Rohinton Nariman. During the course of the lecture. i used several couplets and my senior mr ryan karanjawala told me that you have not used any couplet for the speaker <laughs> let me tell you the best couplet ever written which will reflect the personality of mr nariman is by ghalib and ghalib had said ye ye masa i will explain it to you ye masail e tasawwuf ye tera bayan ghalib तुझे हम वली समझते जो नबादा खार होता योर अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ फिलासफी एंड योर कमांड ऑफ एक्सप्रेशन आई वुड हैव कंसिडर यू बी टू बी अ सेंट इफ यू हैड एबस्टेन फ्रॉम एल्कोहल हिज डॉटर एंड सन इन लॉ यू हेयर आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट एम टू टेल देम दैट आई हैव यूज दिस कपलेट फॉर हिम Mr Tarkunde as you all know was a great civil rights lawyer and believed in secularism which is the hallmark of our constitution let me share this small couplet from allama akbal who was himself a barrister from the lincoln's inn budkhane ke darwaze pe sota hai brahman takbeer ko rota hai muslima tahe mehrab मशरक से हो बेजार न मगरब से हजर कर फितरत का इशारा है कि हर शब को सहर कर द ब्राह्मण गार्ड्स द फेन एंड स्लीप्स एट गेट द मुस्लिम इन मॉस निश बिवेल्स हिज फेथ डोंट शन द ईस्ट नॉर लुक ऑन द वेस्ट विथ स्कॉन सिंस नेचर यान्स फॉर चेंज ऑफ डस्ट फ्रॉम डस्ट टू डॉन आई नो नाउ हैव अ प्लेजेंट ड्यूटी टू परफॉर्म आई विल रिक्वेस्ट मिसिज ताहिरा करंजवाला granddaughter of late mr tarkunde to present a potted plant we are living in a, play, a time when you know ncr is very polluted so we are, we are not giving bouquets a potted plant to our chief guest honorable the chief justice of india tahira karanjawal i will now request mr kishan kumar gogna who had a long association with mr tarkunde to give a potted plant to our president honorable mr justice madan bhimrao lokur 
Mr. Kishan. I will now request Mr. Ashok Panda, Senior Advocate, to give a potted plant to our Vice President, Mr. Raju Ramachandran. Mr. Ashok. I will now request Mr. Ram Raju Ramachandran, our Vice President, to speak about Mr. Tarkunde and al also to br briefly introduce our speaker, though he needs no introduction. He will also, after his speech, invite Honorable the Chief Justice of India to deliver his lecture. Thank you. Good evening. Vital Mahadev Tarkunde was born on the 3rd of July, 1909. He had a rich and full life. In the course of his eventful life, he studied agriculture, then became a barrister. There's only one other lawyer I know who studied agriculture and then become a lawyer. He studied at the London School of Economics returned to India in 1933 to practice law at Pune. The same year, he joined the Congress Socialist Party and the Indian National Congress, but left the Congress Social Socialist Party disillusioned with their vote against Subhash Chandra Bose. He then joined the League of the Radical Congressmen, led by his mentor, M. N. Roy. In 1940, Tarkunde, along with M. N. Roy, resigned from the Indian National Congress on their ex uh, decision to participate along with the British in the Second World War. He became a full-time member of the Radical Democratic Party in 1942. When he suspended his practice, he served as the General Secretary of the party till 1948, when the party itself was dissolved by M. N. Roy. The party's ideology was radical humanism. To propagate this ideology with M. N. Roy, he edited the Radical Humanist Journal and supported it with his own income. When the humanists of the world came together to sign the Second Humanist Manifesto, Tarkunde also participated in the deliberations and was a signatory to the manifesto. He resumed his practice in 1948, moving from Pune to Bombay. And within nine years of his resuming practice in 1957, he became a judge of the Bombay High Court. He retired as a judge at the age of 60, though he could have continued till 62. He moved to Delhi and set up his practice in the Supreme Court. During the emergency, Tarkunde played a pivotal role in the founding of the PUCL, People's Union of Civil Liberties, and was its founding president. He was also instrumental in the Citizens Justice Committee, which conducted investigations and fact-finding missions into the excesses of the emergency during, of the state during this period. Tarkunde passed away on the 22nd of March, 2004, at the ripe old age of 95. The first memorial lecture was in 2006, as you were already told, by former att Attorney General, late Sri Soli Surabji. And since then, there have been 13 lectures given by distinguished and eminent speakers drawn from different fields and different walks of life. This year, we are fortunate that the 14th lecture is being delivered by Justice Dhananjay Chandrachud who started his practice at a time when Tarkunde was still a formidable figure at the bar. Chief Justice Chandrachud has had a very distinguished and scintillating academic and legal career, of which it is not necessary for me to give all the details. But 
as an aging lawyer i think i can take this liberty and this little bit of mischief i think i can do i need to emphasize that he is a true scholar judge a true jurist and a real phd from harvard it's necessary to say this because very often you suddenly find a fellow senior advocate or a judge uh, appending a doctor to his name and then you get to know it's an honorary doctorate uh, he became a senior advocate at a very young age 38 additional solicitor general at the same age and a high court judge again at the very young age of about 40 and a half he is the first chief justice of india sitting or former to deliver the tarkonde memorial lecture hmm. while as a practicing lawyer i should not extol the virtues of a sitting judge beyond reasonable limits i can say that the distinguished speaker today is a dynamic judge both in terms of carrying the law forward and in revolutionizing the functioning of our courts through technology he is a liberal judge a compassionate judge and a humanist and his heart is where tarkonde's heart was may i now invite dr justice dy chandrachud chief justice of india to deliver the 14th vm tarkonde memorial lecture on upholding civil liberties in the digital age privacy surveillance and free speech a subject dear to tarkonde's heart thank you so very much for this very warm introduction uh, raju a very good evening justice madan lokur ijaz makbul mr raju ramchandran manik ryan and the family and the distinguished guests present today i extend my warm greetings to all of you present in the audience this evening it's conventional really to begin these kind of lectures by saying that it's a great honor to deliver the lecture but today when i say so i truly deeply mean it from the bottom of my heart that it's a great honor to deliver the 14 justice vm tarkunde memorial lecture the previous 13 speakers who graced this platform with their wisdom and insights have been eminent public intellectuals individuals i deep, deeply respect and admire and therefore i think it's a great honor for that reason first and foremost to be invited by manik and ryan but apart from that and i'm going to be speaking about justice tarkunde i thought it would be in it would have been rather easy for me if i was told that this lecture is all about my recollections my memories about justice tarkunde or bhau as we knew him i could have spoken the whole 30 or 40 minutes just speaking about him but let me flip the order and i begin on a very personal note for which you will really forgive me because i can't but begin a tribute to justice tarkunde than on a personal note well i must tell you at a very personal level that in our family i was a considerably late born child so i've had to share i've had more than an even share of the burdens and the delights of someone who has arrived into the family a little later than was expected i had the benefit of sharing fond memories of bhau and chitra tai were very very close to my parents my father and bhau shared the bench of the bombay high court but just begin i'll begin by sharing a few memories that i have of the great man walking with bhau on the golf course when he was doing his typical nine hole or 18 hole round he took everything seriously there was nothing in life that he didn't do seriously whether whether it was writing that article for the radical humanist or even that round on the golf course 
accompanying Bhau and Chitratai for a Shakespeare play driven by Justice Tarkunde to Kamani Auditorium. He occupied a bungalow in the Bombay High Court pool called Ajanta on Narayan Dabulkar Road. And I have warm memories of swinging on the roots of the banyan tree in his home. Simple pleasures of life in a simple childhood. Observing the meticulousness of Bhau, a trait which I have imbibed, which I maintain even today, is to use only a scissor to cut a strip of the Crocin tablet. <laughs> there was no other way he would ever cut the strip of tablets. Seeing him moved to tears, listening to the rendition of Bageshri by Kishori Amonkar. For a giant intellectual that he was, he was so easily moved to tears by, by art, by literature. The childlike innocence of a great giant at the bar, when he was conferred with the Humanist Award in Germany, he had to undertake his trip to Frankfurt. And I was briefing him in a matter as a young lawyer, and he said that there is this airline which is called Luft Hansa, which I've been asked to take to Germany. And then finally, some of the great advice that I received at his feet, when he told me, don't stay here in Delhi. Delhi is if you want to make a lot of money, but if you want to learn the law, please start your career in the smaller courts in Mumbai. And he said, concentrate on the volume of work. That's when you will learn how to deal with judges, understand judges, understand the niceties of the case, understand your court, the judges, the good, the indifferent, and the not so good. So I have this whole life full of memories, and I could have spoken for the whole of my lecture on just the impact which he has had on our society. But moving from the truly personal, may I say that Justice Tarkunde was a man I had the pleasure of not just interacting with and briefing as a lawyer, but also looking up to as a legal luminary. His dedication to civil liberties inspired me as a young lawyer and continues to inspire me as I serve as a judge of a constitutional court today. That Justice Tarkunde is regarded as the father of the civil rights movement in India is no surprise. In every role he donned, as a senior advocate, a high court judge, and activist, he was steadfast in his commitment to democracy, radical humanism, and liberty. As a young member of the bar, I had the honor of briefing Justice Tarkunde on a variety of cases. The one standout case I remember was Sodan Singh versus New Delhi Municipal Committee, briefed by Mr. Parikh, who is in the audience. A dispute about the right of pavement hawkers in New Delhi to carry on their occupation. And I had prepared my whole brief on the Tehbazari rules, on the provisions of the statutory enactment, and he kept it aside. He says, no, 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 he says, in a matter like this, you must look at the social purpose of the law. We'll read the law and the statute later, but let's understand the purpose of the law in regulating the rights of pavement dwellers and pavement hawkers. Each time I briefed this extraordinary man I left his chamber with new insights and a fresh perspective of the law. His range of legal knowledge, foresight, and ability to ground legal issues in their larger social context was nothing short of remarkable. In addition to his legal acumen, Justice Tarkunde was an iconoclast, if I can call him that, in the true sense of the term. Professor Shamnath Bashir, himself an illustrious scholar who was an ardent advocate of privacy and digital rights, the theme of today's lecture described the term iconoclasm as a streak that challenges established wisdom time and again, a streak that refuses to stoop to the powers that be, a streak that thinks nothing of being attacked for attacking cherished beliefs. Throughout his life, Justice Tarkunde challenged established wisdom through his professional career and refused to stoop to the metaphorical powers that be. Justice Tarkunde served as a political worker, followed by a legal practitioner, a judge of the Bombay High Court, and finally went back to legal practice again. 
Justice Tarkunde was an ardent advocate of M. N. Roy's philosophy of radical humanism that sought a balance between revolutionary change and humanistic values. He founded the Indian Radical Humanist Association and was also an editor of the Radical Humanist, a weekly journal. And he always found time, the space, the resources to contribute to this journal week after week. And after his lifetime, it was taken, away, taken over by the very distinguished juniors at the Bombay Bar, initially Mr. M. A. Rane and also, of course, Justice R. A. Jagirdar. M. N. Roy conceptualized radical humanism with the belief that freedom is the supreme value because the urge for freedom is the essence of human existence. He aimed to create a society that values individual freedom, social justice, and a scientific inquiry while recognizing the dignity and potential of every individual. Justice Tarkunde, in no uncertain terms, exemplified this ideology throughout his life and work. In 1974, in collaboration with Jayaprakash Narayan, Justice Tarkunde started an organization called the Citizens for Democracy to defend and strengthen democracy in India. In 1975 and 76, during the period of the emergency, he formed one of India's oldest civil liberties organizations called the People's Union of Civil Liberties, PUCL, setting the stage for India's deep traditions of civil liberties activism that continues to date. No book, academic article or chronicle of the internal emergency which was imposed in 1975 is complete without a reference to Justice Tarkunde's spirited defense of personal liberty and democracy, both inside and outside the courtroom. Luminaries have hailed the courage of Justice Tarkunde for standing his ground against the internal emergency declared in the country. During this period, Justice Tarkunde played a significant role in defending civil liberties across the nation. He took up numerous cases related to punitive detentions under the Maintenance of Internal Security Act, MISA, the jail conditions of detainees, and freedom of the press. At the time, there were very few advocates who were willing to do this work at all. Importantly, Mr. Tarkunde took up these cases without charging fees. One of the first of his legal victories during this period was the release of Mr. Kuldeep Nair, who was then a journalist with the Indian Express, who was detained under the MISA. Mr. Tarkunde argued the habeas corpus petition before the Delhi High Court and successfully got relief for Mr. Nair. Even outside the courtroom, Tarkunde was a vociferous critic of the emergency and wrote several articles that inspired the challenge to the emergency. That Justice Tarkunde has been at the cornerstone of India's older traditions of civil liberties, activism, is uncontested. Justice Tarkunde, unfortunately, passed away in 2004, though after leading a full life, when the digital age in India was relatively nascent. Today, however, there are emerging initiatives and civil society groups that aim to tackle issues such as online censorship, mass surveillance, and internet shutdowns. These initiatives run advocacy campaigns both inside and outside our courtrooms. They represent a contemporary form of protest and activism, which is rooted in Justice Tarkunde's tradition of safeguarding citizens' liberties. In many ways, the digital liberties activism of today's age of the internet is a way of upholding the pre-existing traditions of civil liberties activism a new wine in an old bottle, as Justice Krishnaya would have said. The core emphasis of the civil liberties movement that Justice Tarkunde championed is mirrored by digital rights activism today. The aim is to curb the abuse of state power and create a space for dissent and democracy to prosper. Not only are the aims of digital activism similar, but they share a deep-rooted bond on the ground as well. The People's Union for Civil Liberties, one of the oldest civil liberties organizations in our country with whom Justice Tarkunde was closely associated during his lifetime, secured one of the first landmark decisions of the Supreme Court regarding online censorship. 
TUCL petitioned the court for the repeal of Section 66A of the Information Technology Act 2000 to safeguard the expression of dissent online. The provision criminalized what was termed as offensive speech on the internet and was being widely used by various governments to stifle voices in the opposition. Ultimately, the Supreme Court in Shreya Singhal versus the Union of India, a judgment authored by Justice Nariman, invalidated the provision and set the stage for legal activism in the digital space. Incidentally, Ijaz Magbul's little shairi on Justice Nariman is what we in law call a reportable judgment. <laughs> the saint minus or plus the wine. In the movie, The Social Network, the character portraying Scene Parker, the first president of the social media platform Facebook, famously, famously said, we lived on farms, then we lived in cities, and now we are going to live on the internet. As we strive to uphold the legacy of Justice Tarkunde today, it would be fitting to explore a theme that while beyond his lifetime, his philosophy continues to steer. Indeed, discussing a theme that contemplates the future aligns with honoring the legacy of a man who was way ahead of his time. Today I will speak on the topic on upholding civil liberties in the digital age, privacy, surveillance, and free speech. I will engage with the discussions around privacy, exploring how a society transitioning into the digital age can strike the delicate balance between progress and the right to privacy. To this effect, I will locate privacy in its historical context, lay down an overview of Indian and global jurisprudence on digital privacy, and the interplay between mass surveillance and privacy. Finally, I will address the unique theoretical challenges that the right to free speech and expression poses in the context of the internet. In this ever unfolding and evolving digital era, the preservation of civil liberties has transcended the confines of mere legality. It has emerged as the very essence of our democratic ethos. This crucial juncture demands a delicate equilibrium between privacy, surveillance, and free speech, especially in the vibrant tapestry of India, where the implications hold profound significance. India's journey through the corridors of the digital realm resonates with the indomitable spirit portrayed in the Bollywood blockbuster, Three Idiots. I would like to reminisce about the scene where the protagonists find themselves faced with the unexpected challenge of assisting a woman in labor. Stranded in a remote location with no immediate access to medical help. In this raw and vulnerable moment, the characters showcase not only wit and ingenuity, but also a deep resilience in the face of adversity. This scene serves as a metaphor for India's journey in the digital realm, a nation faced with unforeseen challenges, yet exhibiting a collective spirit to adapt, innovate, and triumph. Just as the character in Three Idiots ingeniously work together to bring new life into the world, India too is birthing a new era, one defined by technological innovation, connectivity, and an unwavering spirit to overcome hurdles. From the bustling streets of Mumbai to the tranquil landscapes of rural India and to the cultural traditions of Awadh, we see stories of ordinary individuals from various walks of life embracing UPI for seamless transactions. It's not just street vendors. It is a homemaker in Kanpur purchasing groceries, the small town artisans selling handmade crafts in Madurai, and the tech-savvy college student ordering a meal online in Pune, all contributing to the democratization of financial access. This adoption of digital payment solutions resonates far beyond a specific demographic it underscores the pervasive impact of technology in reshaping how we engage in commerce, transcending geographical and socioeconomic boundaries. 
In witnessing this widespread integration of digital tools into the fabric of our everyday life, we find ourselves at the nexus of progress and a critical juncture where the very essence of individual privacy comes into focus. As we navigate this digital landscape, where financial transactions seamlessly traverse our devices, questions arise about the safeguarding of our personal information. The narratives of convenience and accessibility converge. But this cannot be detached from the necessity to protect the sanctity of individual privacy. Privacy in the digital age is not just a matter of data protection. It's a fundamental right that we must actively champion and protect. The stories of individuals navigating the digital realm from rural artisans to urban professionals highlight the myriad ways in which personal data becomes intertwined with our daily interactions. As we delve into the complexity of privacy concerns, it's essential to recognize that the digital era is a realm where information is both currency and vulnerability. The same technology that facilitates seamless transactions and connects us across distances also opens up avenues for potential exploitation. We are all interconnected, but we are also interconnected in a world which is seamless in terms of networking, hate and violence. It beckons us to reflect on how we can harness the benefits of a digitized society while safeguarding the very essence of what makes us individuals, our autonomy, personal narratives, and the right to control the narratives of our own lives. The profound insights of Warren and Brandeis in 1890, in their article titled, Right to Privacy in the Harvard Law Review, resonate with the contemporary, globalized world shaped by the dominance of the internet and information technology. They argued well over a hundred years ago that the principle protecting personal writings and other personal productions is not merely a safeguard against theft and physical appropriation, but an affirmation of an inviolate personality. This embodies a core tenet of freedom and liberty an assertion of the inviolable nature of the human personality. The technology that initially prompted the need for privacy preservation, photography, served as a catalyst for articulating the right to be free from intrusion. Warren and Brandeis' reflections on the impact of technology remain prescient, especially in an age dominated by the internet, where the boundaries of privacy are continuously being redefined. While contemporary accounts often attribute the modern conception of the right to privacy to Warren and Brandeis, history points to Thomas Cooley in 1888, who in his treatise on the law of torts, employed the phrase, the right to be let alone. Cooley in discussing personal immunity, underscored the right of an individual as one of complete immunity, the right to be alone. This historical context emphasizes the enduring nature of the concept and its evolution over time. Privacy, as understood through this lens, emerges as a natural right, an inherent aspect of an individual's control over their personality. Rooted in the belief that certain rights are natural and inseparable from the human personality, Privacy becomes a fundamental and inalienable aspect of life. John Locke's observations in the 17th century, asserting that the lives, liberties, and estates of individuals are a private preserve by natural law, set the stage for the concept of a private preserve creating barrier against external interference. William Blackstone in 1765 articulated the concept of natural liberty identifying absolute rights which are vested in the individual by the immutable laws of nature. These absolute rights categorized into personal security, personal liberty, and property, emphasize the legal and uninterrupted enjoyment of life, limbs, body, health, and reputation, an early acknowledgement of the multifaceted nature of privacy. 
as we navigate the complexities of a digital age, these historical perspectives on privacy as a natural right remind us that the preservation of individual autonomy and the sanctity of the human personality are enduring principles that transcend time and technological evolution. This intricate interplay between surveillance by the state and an individual's right to privacy has been a subject of compelling debate within Indian jurisprudence. The first case that dealt with privacy was our Rajgopal versus the state of Tamil Nadu. Our court determined that a magazine possessed the right to publish an autobiography penned by a prisoner, even in the absence of the prisoner's consent or authorization. Despite efforts by prison officials to hinder the publication by compelling the prisoner to request its non-publication, the court underscored the need to maintain a delicate equilibrium between press freedom and the right to privacy. The court concluded that the state and its officials lacked the authority to impose prior restraint on materials that could potentially defame the state. In the landmark case of People's Union of Civil Liberties versus Union of India, the court unequivocally held that telephone tapping infringes the guarantee of free speech and expression under Article 19.1a unless authorized by Article 19.2. Drawing from international legal instruments, the judgment emphasized the protection of privacy under Article 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. This protection, the court asserted, must serve as an interpretative tool for construing the provisions of the Indian Constitution. The judgment in PUCL is significant, not only for its stance on telephone tapping, but also for its construction of the right to privacy as a constitutionally protected right. This interconnected interpretation recognizes that wiretapping infringes privacy and by extension other fundamental rights. The evolution of the right to privacy reached a watershed moment in 2017 with the judgment in K.S. Puttaswamy versus Union of India. The Supreme Court recognized privacy as an expansive right covering not only physical invasion but also the realm of the mind, decisions, choices and information. The Supreme Court overruled its earlier judgments in M.P. Sharma and Khadak Singh firmly establishing the right to privacy as a fundamental right. While acknowledging that the right to privacy is not absolute, the judgment delineated a stringent st standard of judicial review for cases of state intrusion, emphasizing the principles of legality, need, proportionality, and procedural guarantees against abuse. While navigating this complex terrain of privacy and state surveillance, Indian jurisprudence has continually grappled with striking a balance between individual rights and legitimate state interests. The nuanced approach taken by the courts reflects an evolving understanding of privacy as a dynamic and a multifaceted right, adapting to the challenges posed by the advancements in technology and the expansive reach of state action. For instance, India and Sweden despite their geographical and cultural differences, find themselves grappling with similar privacy concerns in the digital age. In India, the debate around the implementation of Aadhaar, a biometric identification system, raised questions about the balance between individual privacy and the state's interest in ensuring efficient service delivery. Similarly, Sweden's population registry system has raised similar concerns as it consolidates vast amounts of personal data. In our exploration of the intricate dance, if I may call it that way, between privacy and state surveillance, it is imperative to broaden our lens and glean insights from international jurisprudence. Three striking cases from the Supreme Court of Estonia, the South African Constitutional Court, and the European Court of Human Rights underscore the global struggle to safeguard individual privacy in the face of advancing surveillance technologies. In a case heard by the Supreme Court of Estonia, the court articulated a crucial principle that as the invasion of privacy intensifies, 
Oversight measures must be correspondingly detailed and effective. The greater the surveillance, the higher the need of supervision over those measures of surveillance. The case dealt with the covert surveillance authorized by the codes of criminal procedure in Estonia. The court recognizing the intensive violation of fundamental rights with covert surveillance underscores the need for an oversight mechanism. It deemed the absence of such oversight as rendering a specific provision of the statute unconstitutional. A few years later, the South African Constitutional Court, in fact in 2021, in a landmark decision in the Center for Investigative Journalism versus Minister of Justice, delivered a judgment against the regulation of interception of communications and provision of Communication Relation Information Act 2002. This legislation in South Africa, governing interceptions of communications, faced constitutional scrutiny as it lacked crucial safeguards to protect the right to privacy. A journalist, and there are journalists here, a journalist upon discovering that her communications had been intercepted, challenged the law alongside an investigative journalism center. The court's unequivocal declaration that the elements of the statute were unconstitutional emphasized the critical need for oversight and accountability. The court noted that the veil of secrecy shrouding the interception regime hindered any challenge to surveillance orders, escalating the risk of abuse and violating the right to privacy. Turning our gaze now to the European Court of Human Rights, the case very aptly called Big Brother Watch versus the United Kingdom, engaged with the intersection of electronic surveillance programs and fundamental human rights. The Grand Chamber of the ECHR found sections of the UK's Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act to be in violation of the European Convention on Human Rights. The case scrutinized electronic surveillance programs operated by the government communications headquarters, highlighting deficiencies in authorization and oversight. The court's judgment underscored the necessity for robust safeguards, emphasizing the absence of such safeguards, which violated the Convention's guarantees of privacy and the freedom of expression. These judgments, which I have just referred to, serve as illustrations of nations grappling with the delicate balance between state surveillance and individual rights asserting the paramount importance of robust legal frameworks with built-in safeguards. In examining various international perspectives on privacy and state intrusion, it becomes evident that the struggle to protect privacy is a global endeavor. Courts worldwide grapple with challenges posed by technological advancements, highlighting the crucial need for legal frameworks prioritizing accountability, transparency, and the fundamental right to privacy. Drawing from this global perspective, I will now explore specific facets of privacy infringement, beginning with facial recognition technology. Facial recognition technology, FRT, represents a marvel of technological innovation, but its application raises significant privacy and discrimination concerns. It is often contended that the right to privacy is a privilege of the few and an individual must make a choice between the right to privacy and the welfare entitlements provided by the state. But studies have now revealed the inherent biases within FRT algorithms, especially in identifying darker skinned women, ethnic minorities and transgender individuals. For instance, a study by the MIT Media Lab found higher error rates for darker skinned females in commercial FRT systems. These inaccuracies gain significance when integrated into the criminal justice system, disproportionately affecting vulnerable groups. The COVID-19 pandemic accentuated these concerns with controversies around the use of CR FRTs in health data management. Therefore, I would like to dispel the claim that economic status and access to welfare entitlements are more important 
than civil and political rights for socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. All individuals, regardless of their socioeconomic status, are deeply, deeply impacted by violations of the right to privacy, autonomy, and intimacy. In the realm of artificial intelligence, we find that the unchecked algorithms used by tech giants compound privacy concerns. The movie, again, called The Minority Report, directed by Steven Spielberg, envisions a future where a specialized police department apprehends criminals based on foreknowledge provided by three psychics called precogs. The movie raises ethical questions about the potential misuse of predictive technologies, illustrating a dystopian society where privacy is virtually non-existent. The precognitive nature of AI depicted in the film poses profound dangers to personal privacy as individuals are targeted for crimes they have not yet committed, challenging the very fabric of autonomy and individual rights. The dual nature of technology is apparent as a catalyst for progress, harboring inherent privacy risks. Surveillance analytics, despite its benefits in healthcare and crime prevention, prompts substantial privacy concerns. Practices such as web cookies and social media data harvesting have raised alarm bells. The global data protection regime or regulations implemented by the European Union sets a global standard prioritizing individual privacy rights. However, debates persist, exemplified by conflicts between the US government and tech companies like Apple over encrypted data access, highlighting the security versus privacy conundrum. The Putuswami judgment introduced a, a stringent proportionality test, yet its operational complexities pose challenges, particularly in evaluating modern surveillance programs. Examining the constitutionality of global surveillance programs reveals significant challenges due to limited information on their operational reach. The lack of clarity hampers comprehensive evaluations of their adherence to constitutional standards. We don't know what they are doing, so how do we decide whether they are in breach of the Constitution? A collaborative effort between policymakers, technology companies, and informed citizens is therefore imperative. Robust oversight mechanisms, stringent authorization protocols, and increased public awareness without compromising ongoing investigation constitute the way forward. A pertinent example which I'd like to share is the UK's Investigatory Powers Tribunal, which functions as a judicial body overseeing surveillance activities, ensuring compliance with legal standards, and protecting individual rights. The delicate balance between technological progress and privacy preservation mandates a careful, synergistic approach. It necessitates legislative precision, transparent oversight, and an informed populace to ensure that technological strides do not come at the cost of fundamental human values. Finally, the last aspect of civil liberties in the digital age that I seek to address is upholding the constitutionally protected right of free speech on the internet. Very crucial to our times. Here, the traditional understanding of civil liberties can be distinguished from digital rights activism in two major ways. Firstly, the unprecedented proliferation of disinformation and hate speech on the internet have offered a serious challenge to the traditional ways of understanding free speech in a democracy. Secondly, in traditional civil rights activism of the sort that Bahu pursued, there was a classic state activist corporation relationship which played out in most of the struggles. Today, however, large social media corporations don't play the stereotypical role of being an entity that needs to be constrained or viewed 
as complicit with the state. When it comes to content moderation of online speech, there is a complex moral dilemma that arises in attempting to balance two key values. Firstly, upholding the freedom of expression. And second, the prevention of harm which may be caused by the spread of misinformation on the internet. There has been a plethora of discussion in recent times about the consequences of disinformation, the need for a regulatory mechanism, and the free speech concerns raised by such legislation or policies. Most criticisms of global anti-fake news legislation are based on concerns that such legislation can be overbroad and prone to misuse, thus restricting legitimate speech as well. Such issues about how to define disinformation and prevent selective misuse are essential. However, they put the cart before the horse. All liberal democracies purport to protect the right to free speech and expression. However, what remains contested is the application of this principle to concrete situations. The presence of laws against defamation, incitement to violence, and contempt of court indicate that free speech protection does not extend to all acts of communication. In deciding the contours of this protection, courts and lawmakers are applying a certain theoretical understanding of free speech. Where can disinformation be located in these theories? Before getting into the nitty-gritty details of how to tackle disinformation, we must ask ourselves a more fundamental question. Is disinformation protected by traditional free speech theories and constitutional jurisprudence under Article 19 of the Indian Constitution? I believe, and that's only a hypothesis, that demonstrably false facts are not protected by traditional free speech theories. The most oft-quoted theory of free speech is the concept of a marketplace of ideas that has found its way into Indian jurisprudence from the First Amendment in the United States. The Supreme Court has relied on this understanding of free speech in several landmark cases like Shreya Singhal and Bennett Coleman one in 1973 and the other in 2015. This theory of free speech, which can be traced from Justice Holmes' dissent in Abrams versus United States, is based on the frictionless exchange of ideas. That a marketplace of ideas is a marketplace which promotes a frictionless communication of views, of thoughts, of points of perspective. It postulates the concept that just like a free market of goods, where a consumer demand helps the best products rise to the top, a democratic public sphere with a free exchange of ideas will let the best ideas prevail. The usual presumption therefore is that under this theory, disinformation is a part of the marketplace of ideas and the only way to counter it is with more speech. However, Several scholars, and a very distinguished scholar by the name of Ari Waldman, argue that false facts are not a part of this marketplace of ideas. The marketplace can only exist when there is agreement on the veracity or the truthfulness of basic facts. There is no marketplace of facts. In fact, the goal of fake news is to create a marketplace. To erode, to erode the stability of foundational elements of society, namely the truth itself. In this way, tol tolerating the proliferation of fake news erodes the free and open debate that democracy intends to protect. If we cannot agree on the veracity of basic facts, debate stops, partisanship hardens, and social solidarity breaks down. A study which was conducted by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which studied 106, 126,000 false stories on social media, found that false news spreads faster, deeper, and wider than the truth in all informational categories. 
these false stories were retweeted from 3 million accounts approximately 4.5 million times. Simply by virtue of the scale of dissemination, fake news drowns out true information, replacing the character of discourse from truth seeking to the, to the loudest voice. Disinformation, therefore, has the power of impairing democratic discourse forever, pushing a marketplace of free ideas to the point of collapse under the immense weight of fake stories. A cursory glance at the newspaper every day will bring to the fore inst instances of communal and vigilante violence fueled by fake rumors and targeted disinformation campaigns. Across the globe, be it Libya, the Philippines, Germany, or the United States, elections and civil society have been tarnished by the proliferation of fake news. The purpose of the metaphor, a marketplace of ideas, was to promote an exchange of ideas premised on an agreement on basic facts. Justice Holmes's dissent was in the context of persecuting anti-war activists for their speech. Thus, what was being freely exchanged was radical ideas about existing facts and not the veracity or truthfulness of the facts themselves. For example, whether a religious site was desecrated or not, whether a speech was actually delivered, whether COVID-19 is caused by a virus or a bacteria are all facts and not ideas or opinions with many possible answers. I remember that while the country was faced with the tragic COVID-19 pandemic, the internet was rife with the most outrageous fake news and rumors a source of comic relief in very difficult times, but also forcing us to rethink the limits of free speech on the internet. Traditionally, freedom of speech and expression was deemed to be an essential part of civil rights activism because of the fear that the government would prevent certain kinds of speech from entering the marketplace. With the, ad with the advent of troll armies, and organized disinformation campaigns across different social media platforms, the fear is that there is an overwhelming barrage of speech that distorts the truth. This, this epistemological battle of sorts was explained eloquently in the New York Times in 2020 when it said, the spewing of falsehoods isn't meant to win any battle of ideas. Its goal is to prevent the actual battle from being fought. Therefore, we cannot fall back on traditional notions of free speech and must find new theoretical frameworks to locate free speech on the internet. The second point of distinction lies in the rupture of the traditional state activist corporation relationship. Civil rights activists no longer place the corporation within the traditional box of an entity whose power is to be restricted. In fact, to the contrary, they rely on social media corporations as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to expand their freedom of speech and expression, often in opposition to governance. In an article which is titled Defending Our Digital Liberties, the Changing Contours of an Old New Civic Activism, a distinguished scholar, Ankita Pandey, argues that in the past, civil liberties activists had clearly defined battles. They opposed the government and the alliance of the government with corporates that allowed corporations to breach certain standards in the name of progress. From the perspective of many civil rights activists, the political arena was sharply divided Government and private capital were on one side, while people and activists were on the other. But that world has changed. Today, digital rights activism is intertwined with private platforms in an unprecedented way. Digital liberties are being fought in a public space that is privately owned. Those looking for a form of resistance, unsullied by the presence of private capital, chase a nostalgic illusion today more than ever before. 
the basic principles of liberal and socialistic policies and politics remain the same, liberty, equality, and justice, but they are being fought for in a new space and conducted via a new privately owned medium that transforms the character of the activism itself. However, there is a flip side to adopting privately owned platforms as the medium for dissent, activism, and the expression of free speech. With corporations wielding such immense power, there is an immense amount of trust placed on them to act as the arbiters of acceptable and unacceptable speech, a role that was earlier played by the state itself. This can have disastrous effects on our societies. It has been widely reported and recognized by the United Nations that social media was used as a tool for ethnic cleansing in Myanmar by the military and members of civil society. Unlike state actors who are held accountable by the constitution and the electorate, social media platforms are, are, are relatively unregulated. This is another novel challenge that digital liberties activists have to find unique solutions for. In conclusion, may I say, while digital liberties activism including the protection of privacy and free speech, have gained currency at an unprecedented pace, we are still in an early period of theorizing on it. The civil liberties movement, led by luminaries like Justice Tarkunde, acted as a precursor to a larger narrative. In narratives, the very principles Justice Tarkunde ardently upheld are the guiding lights that beckon us in this era of digital transformation. This transformation is not just about technology. It is about the people and their rights. The torch that Justice Tarkunde carried for justice now illuminates our path towards safeguarding digital freedoms, ensuring that as we traverse through this landscape, we do so with the commitment to upholding the basic values of justice, equality, and freedom. After all, as the world moves online, our battles to uphold civil liberty must also follow suit. Thank you very much. Thank you, my lord. Our Chief Justice is the head of the family, but he only suffers from one disqualification. He looks very young and very youthful to be, uh, to be the head of the family. Today, today in, his, uh, uh, in his speech on freedom of speech and expression, he has left us spellbound. And I'm reminded of a couplet from Faiz Ahmed Faiz, who had said, Zuba pe mohar lagi hai to kya? Zuba pe mohar lagi hai to kya? Ke rakh di hai har halqay zanjeer mein zuba mein I will now request our president, Justice Madan Lokur, to give his presidential address. Thank you, Ijaz. It's a very difficult uh, time that I will be facing now after this brilliant, outstanding, and erudite uh, lecture given by Honorable Chief Justice Chandrachud. Thank you very much for that outstanding lecture. Uh, Mr. Raju Ramchandran, members of the Executive Committee of the Justice Tarkunde Foundation, ladies and gentlemen, We've once again had the privilege of hosting an outstanding and erudite lecture by uh, Honorable the Chief Justice on the subject of civil liberties, which, as you all know, is, uh, is extremely close to the heart of uh, Justice Tarkunde. And I'm sure that uh, with this lecture, if he had been alive, he would have been really thrilled at how civil liberties has changed over the years. Justice Tarkunde was what we might today describe as a civil liberties and rights activist. 
In 1974, he and Jayaprakash Narayan started an organization called Citizens for Democracy to fight against corruption in public life and defend and strengthen democracy in our country. In 1976, during the emergency, he established the People's Union of Civil Liberties, or PUCL, as we have been told, with Jayaprakash Narayan as its president. A few years later, in 1980, Justice Tarkunde became its president, and the organization has flourished since then in upholding the civil liberties movement. In a commemorative volume of his writings, Mr. Palkiwala described him as an outstanding social worker and political philosopher who has imbibed the social and political philosophy of radical humanism in all its manifold aspects and has put the tenets and principles of that philosophy in his life. Justice Tarkunde was prescient in many ways and wrote hundreds of articles on a variety of subjects and topics. I would like to quote two passages from his writings that are relevant even today. On the independence of the judiciary, he wrote in August 1981 in the monthly journal, The Radical Humanist. And I quote, we are witnessing today a virtual confrontation between the executive and the judiciary in the country. It arises from the insistence of the executive to have a decisive voice in the appointment and transfer of high court judges. A similar claim of the executive in regard to the appointment of judges of the Supreme Court is implicit in the controversy. He believed, Justice Tarkunde believed, that judicial independence is necessary for us to continue to have the rule of law and enjoyment of civil liberties. Therefore, he wrote that it is for the people to participate in a strong countrywide movement for protecting judicial independence. Independence of the judiciary cannot be safeguarded by judicial action alone. Justice Tarkunde was a great votary of decentralization of power. He ascribed the steep fall in moral standards in public life to centralization of power. He wrote in 1980, and I quote, Centralized power provides the motive for the unprincipled scramble for power in which most of the political parties are engaged. Collection of black money donations and deluding the voters by populist slogans and tall promises. These and similar practices are the main cause of the present moral chaos. In September 2003, he wrote about secularism and expressed the view that Again, I quote, in a multi-religious country like India, democracy can subsist only on the basis of secularism. A secular democracy does not require that the people at large should have no religious faith. What is required is that the bulk of the people should agree that religion should have no bearing on political issues and that therefore there should be a separation of religion and politics. The foundation is proudly keeping his legacy alive for the last several years, primarily through an annual lecture by an eminent personality. Today, we have listened to the 14th memorial lecture. Fortunately, we have transcripts or recordings of earlier lectures and hope to publish them in the coming year. These lectures are a goldmine like today's uh, lecture of views and thoughts on a variety of subjects of contemporary relevance and will, I'm sure, enrich all of us. In the coming year, the Foundation hopes to enhance its engagement with civil society to further carry forward the ideals and aspirations of Justice Tarkunde. Thank you and all the best. I will now request our president, Justice Madan Lokur, to give a memento to our chief guest, Honorable Justice D.Y. Chandrakchud, 
as a token to express our gratitude for accepting our in invitation to deliver this lecture. I will request our secretary to give a shawl to our chief guest today. I will now request Mrs. Manik Karanjawala, our secretary, to give her vote of thanks. Honorable Chief Justice, honorable judges of the Supreme Court and High Court, distinguished guests, among whom is one of our previous speakers, Mr. Gopal Gandhi. Thank you, Chief Justice, for giving us a scintillating exposition of a subject which is of great concern to all of us. It is indeed a delicate task to balance freedom of speech with respect for the private space of others, which courts will be called upon to protect, especially given the ever-increasing power and reach of social media and advancement of technology. I'm particularly happy to have the Chief Justice as our guest to deliver the Tarkunde Memorial Lecture this year for another reason. His late father, Justice, Chief Justice Y. V. Chandrachur, and my late father, in whose memory we are meeting today, knew each other for many decades. They were colleagues at the Bombay Bar, brother judges at the Bombay High Court, and close personal friends. My, saw, my father saw our present Chief Justice from a very young age and was always impressed with his ability, his intelligence, extraordinary capacity for hard work, and especially his concern for those who were less fortunate than himself. A little known fact might be that as a schoolboy, he taught the children of the staff members of his father's judicial residence, quite unusual for a young person of that age. There were many subjects on which my father and the Chief Justice would have been in agreement, particularly the crucial importance of civil liberties, the right to dignity of the individual, and respect for the rule of law. He would have been proud and happy to see the Chief Justice agreeing with the argument that he himself had advanced while arguing the ADM Jabalpur case and the reversal of the ratio of that case. He would have also appreciated the several judgments delivered by the Chief Justice regarding the rights of the mar marginalized sections of society and against executive overreach. It is a rich legacy. Thank you, Chief Justice, for sparing your invaluable time. We know how incredibly busy you are. I would like to thank my distinguished audience. I would also like to thank Live Law and Bar and Bench for live streaming of this event and my colleagues on our committee, Justice Lokur, Mr. Ramachandran, Ajaz, Trishan, Ashok, and Mr. Pancholi. I'm extremely grateful to all of you. Thank you.